but he's going to tell us how to apocalypse. Are we streaming? Apocalypse proof your feed source, which in these times, uh, how many people have noticed feed prices are going up? 2x. 2x. Yeah. What if what if you could reduce your dependence on feed coming into your property by half? Well, you just broke even. What if you could reduce it by three quarters? Well, now you're getting ahead. What if you just didn't need it anymore? That's a game changer. That's a game changer. But before we do that, I want to hear one more ask me. Come up to the front desk to tell us because you signed up. Yes. Yes. Come up. Oh, yeah, come up there. You have to come up here. So ask me how I know. Slash life lessons we learn. And when we learn, we're like, of course, that happened that way. So hello, everyone. Uh, speaking of feed. Um, Ask me how I know it's not a good idea to microwave a whole egg. <laughs> <laughs> so I saw this thing somehow you can microwave a, an entire egg, like a hard boiled egg. Doing it raw or doing it in water and taking it out, which the second one is a preferred method. But <laughs> even when you do microwave an egg and you successfully not explode it inside your microwave, ask me how I know that, um, you still have to be cautious of when you peel said egg because there is steam built up in it. And in a galley kitchen that's 10 by 15, it takes a long time to find every shred of hard boiled egg that has exploded very violently in your me how I know. Yeah. Nice. Okay. So don't hard boil the eggs in the microwave. Or let them cool for like half an hour. Or let them cool for half an hour. All right. So now, before one more thing before I hand it over to Nick, um, we have work in sessions after after the afternoon presentations, and what that is is part of why we're doing the Ask Me How I Know is we're learning some useful information from each other, right? How many of the people who have told you something they learned are on the official speaking agenda? Not very many. You guys know so much. And the work-in sessions are designed that if you know something about ham radio, if you know something about 3D printing, you can talk about 3D print. We got shark fishing up there right now, okay? So if there's something you think, you know, I'd like to have a round table about how to, how to transact in Bitcoin or things I've learned about propagating hyenas, just come up to the board and sign up. We'll have work-in sessions each evening. And whoever wants to come to your session does. You put what it is, what time you want to meet, and where you want to meet at. And if somebody's already taken the spot you want to meet, you have to choose a different spot. With that, I'm going to handle, hand it over to the man who changed the trajectory of my home by coming out and visiting. It was kind of nice. Yeah. Nick yeah. Ferguson. All right. <clears throat> so I'm Nick Ferguson. Um, I travel all over the U.S. and abroad um, teaching people how to do things like what we're talking about today. I help people design their properties and troubleshoot problems that they're having and learn how to do it in a slightly better way, um, lean out efficiencies, or just design it intelligently from the get-go. So today... Um, we're going to be talking about apocalypse proof feed store independent. The, I don't know, 10 plus years that I've been doing consulting. Every single one of these ecosystems that people design, every single one of these homesteads has one fatal flaw that almost every single one of them that I've come across, every single one, bar none, has one fatal flaw. And that is, they are completely dependent upon grain elevators functioning and feed being affordable. If that one component breaks, designed breaks. And if everything they've designed breaks and they were counting on that design work, 
that's a big problem. So we need to make sure that the design that we have instituted, that we've developed, works like Jack Show talks about, if times get tough or even if they don't. We don't want to make it so, so um, old school, old world manual labor that it doesn't work if times are good. Okay, we don't need to swing that pendulum so far that we just divorce ourselves from all of technology and all of reality. And we end up with something that's just so manual labor intensive that it does not work if times are good. So we want to make sure it works if times are good or if they're not. So we want to divorce ourselves from dependence on the system. Right. So <clears throat> one of those things that we need to be thinking about, I talk about this all the time is our exit strategy. What if our plans change? Five years down the road, one year down the road, six months down the road, we decide, you know what? I, I like the idea. Mm, the more I eat them, the more I don't like eating them. And so I'm not interested in doing that. We need to make sure we have thought about how are we gonna pivot just in case that happens. <clears throat> All right, so the dilemma is when times are good and we are using the conventional standard, I'm going down to whatever box store or whatever local feed store and I'm buying some feed there. And that is what I feed my goats, my chickens, my quail, my whatever. It's an easy button. It's cheap feed. There's a reason people do it. It's easy, it's cheap, and it works. It's convenient, right? What if times get tough? Times have slowly been getting a little bit tougher with imaginary inflation. I don't know what that word is, apparently. I've just been taught that word. Um, everything gets expensive. Everything does. Um, so what do you do? What can you We can just reduce the number of animals to reduce our feed costs. Because that works, right? Well, that's what a lot of people end up having to do. You look at droughts come through. And, hey, we don't have enough feed. What do we do? Reduce the herd. Cull the herd, right? Um, what happens when you do that? Your profits plummet. Well, if prices are skyrocketing and your profits are plummeting, this does not sound like a trajectory that's going to end positively. If we go into full-on economic depression and there's either no feed or it's so expensive, the bio feed, no animals, equals a starving family. If you're dependent upon that, that's a big problem. That's a sad life. So let's look at a better way to do things, right? If times are good, we start transitioning from dependence on that system away from it. We do things like, like Jack is doing here, we start planting some fodder trees. We plant a fodder forest. We start looking at growing some insects. We'll talk about those tomorrow, uh, later this afternoon. Um, we look into possibly, and you don't have this is looking at buying a hammer mill and pelletizer. And there's nothing wrong with supplementing while you're in this transition period. Absolutely nothing wrong with that. Um, <clears throat> so when times start getting tougher, you're mostly independent already at this point. What happens if you are divorcing yourself from dependence on a feed store, from grain elevators, from grain-based feeds? Your profit margin is skyrocketing compared to all the other producers because they have to pay those high prices and you don't. What do we can expect? expand our operation. When other people are having to cut operation, we can expand. We can grow. We go on to full-on economic depression. We have healthy animals. We have massive profits. We can corner the market, and we have stability. This is the kind of thing that we want to be progressing towards. So, Let's look at the process. What does that process look like? We want to plant fodder trees. This is the foundation. 
talking old, about. old, old technology. Everyone that was here last year, I think I did a presentation on fodder trees last year. You've already heard about this. You've heard me talking about it for I don't know how long. Um, we start with the foundation first. We want to be growing some trees, some perennial crops. And I love trees. They grow fast. They're tough. They're hardy. And they can grow some high quality protein to feed our animals. King of that. I've got them in, in, the, in the list of order. White mulberry is top in my list. It doesn't grow as fast as the next two, hybrid willow and hybrid poplar. The wood. Um, those both grow pff, uh, 15 to 20 feet in a year. That's insane. It can go seriously from a stump in winter to at the end of that year, 15, 16, 18, 20 feet tall in one growing season. That's pretty impressive. Lace bark elm is another one. Um, and then, of course, we have insect production. If we want to lean a lot more heavily towards the poultry side of things, um, chickens are not herbivores. They're, they're so we can't just feed white mulberry. We can feed about 20% white mulberry. That's about the cap because they just can't process it. Um, even though the white mulberry has 12 to 28, sometimes 35, 38% protein, in incredible protein content, really digestible, they just can't process all of the extra cellulose. So we need to be looking at insects if we want to keep poultry. And I like chicken eggs. I like quail. I can't, I can't sustainably keep quail if I have to buy 26, 28% game bird ration and feed soy-based feeds. I don't want I don't, unless I have insects. So we're looking at black soldier flies. We're looking at mealworms. We're looking at dubia roaches. I know people get freaked out about the word roach. Um, it's an insect. Uh, earthworms. And, uh, and then we need to look at stable storage methods. We need to think about how can we make sure that our animal feed is going to be edible by our animals for more than just a day or a week. So we're looking at pellets, we're looking at drying the, the feed, and we're looking at fermenting it. All right. I've used this flow chart quite a few times. I'm just gonna go over it really quick. We're gonna talk about it a little bit more. The foundation is fruit and fodder trees right here. We have yields, we have food, we have profit, resources, and fertility. So the fruit and fodder trees we're just talking about fodder trees right here. We're going to get leaves and we're going to get some mulch. They're going to make a couple different products for us. We're going to harvest the leaves. We're going to feed it to something like rabbits. Let's just use rabbits in this example. We can get a meat yield. We can eat breeding stock. And I tell you what, the next several years are going to be gangbusters for selling people breeding stock. And then we have another yield. You know, most people treat this stuff like garbage. That's fertility. That is a yield. We want to treat every single thing as a positive. We want to find a way to make a, not, a negative into a positive. So we're going to have those rabbits drop their manure straight into an earthworm bin. We're going to put an earthworm bin directly underneath it. If we can't, and we're just putting it directly into some bedding, and it gets collected over the course of a year and kept dry, and we compost. So we got some worms, or we have black soldier fly larvae. You can do the same thing with them. We can sell it as bait. We can take a profit, or we can sell black soldier fly larvae kits to people that want to raise them. You can buy them online. We can sell earthworm uh, packages. Every year, major earthworm farms sell out. You can't get them. If they're selling out every single dang year, guess what? The market's not being met. That's an opportunity for you. And that's something that's really quick and easy to do. Um, are going to create refuse. A lot of times it's called frass. So the mealworms, dubias, all that stuff is going to create 
insect manure. It's highly, highly, highly fertile. It's amazing for plants. In fact, there are even compounds in that insect manure that tell the plants, hey, there's bugs here. We need to bump up chemical production of things that will repel insects. And by using this frass, we can actually make our plants start producing the chemicals that repel insect plants healthier and better able to fight off insects. We've got... Uh, uh, worm tea from these earthworms. That worm tea can go directly into a tank that we have an aerator in. It just pumps some air through it and keeps that system aerobic. Think of it like an aerobic septic tank for worm poop, right? That can be hooked up directly. Very. This is all very simple stuff. That can hook up, be hooked up directly with a simple Venturi siphon to your irrigation line. And so every time you're automatic irrigation what's it doing it's pulling clean water clean irrigation water and it's pulling just a little bit of this worm juice and you put a little float valve in here and it tops it off it keeps it topped off it keeps it aerated it doesn't stink all the fertility is in there and you're automatically irrigating with fertility every single time that goes to your garden we can uh, put some of these worms. If we have too many, we can put some worms in with the chickens and feed our chickens high quality protein. Um, we get compost out of the compost yard, out of our garden. We get veggies, we get weeds and garbage, anything back to those chickens, let them eat it, let them make us eggs and meat and compost. And we take all of that and we return it back to Weed barrier fabric, and then this is white mulberry, and that's white mulberry, and then we've got hybrid poplar on the uphill side, further up that way. And you can see some clear plastic. This area right here, we solarized. Right here, a little bit of and it did not kill all the weeds. I'm gonna show you the next picture is what happens if I did not solarize right there. That's it solarizing, a new spot. That's uh, the freshly uncovered ground that we just solarized. And that is, if it was just cut right there, this little laneway, if it was cut and left for, I think that's two weeks of growth. It's crazy. <clears throat> so I left some space in between these 
so that I could crop in between here or I could run rabbit tractors through there. Also, when these get grown, you'll see some pictures. I'm actually gonna have branches from this row of trees and this row of trees almost touching each other, if not touching each other. So I need to leave enough room. So these are some of the, the systems. This is, I think, in Costa Rica. Um, these are white mulberry in rows. This is what it looks like. I'm just trying to show you what this stuff looks like. This is freshly planted white mulberry. That's what it looks like. This is nothing crazy. We're just planting trees in rows. Imagine, imagine corn. You see corn planted in rows? The reason why they do it in rows? It's easy to manage. You can do it in curves. You can do it in blocks. You can do it however you want. Um, just think about management. Here's some more white mulberry that's grown up. This is probably about a, a one-year stand of white mulberry, and it's probably about uh, six, seven, eight foot tall. That's, that's pretty typical for white mulberry. It can push up to 12, 14 feet in a year, but generally you should be expecting around eight to 10 feet. So these are low pollards. <clears throat> pollard is just cut up high. Coppicing is down low. The reason why we want to pollard would be to prevent growth. Would have more production out of this but what they're doing here is they are pruning everything back down to this one stump right here so it's basically a high stump okay this is pollarding here's some more pollarded trees y'all have probably seen trees that look very similar to this underneath power lines they just prune everything back to these lumps okay and trees like this can grow and live for hundreds of years. Coppicing, where you take it actually down to a stump, those trees actually have a longer lifespan. It basically resets their, their kind of internal clock to teenager status, and they just grow really fast. Beavers actually coppice trees. They will do this with willow all the time. This uh, uh, cambium to lignin, uh, ramial wood like this by just uh, harvesting the one of the benefits is you get more pasture they're not taking up that real estate a drawback is it's more work you're working above the ground um, if you're doing it mechanically you're using specialized equipment. Uh, so why would you coppice? Well, it's cheap management. It can be very simple and easy to coppice. Something as simple as a tractor to mechanically coppice. Something as simple as a tractor with a bush hog behind it. You can literally just set that bush hog high and straddle the row of trees, drive right over them, and just mow them into a stump every single winter. Um, it can be much easier if you're doing everything by hand. If you're doing it by hand, what's easier? Working up above or working at ground level? Way easier at ground level. Coppice. You saw that first picture. It looks kind of nice. They look kind of good. People actually do this and just pay gardeners to go and trim their shrubs into hedges because it looks pretty. Well, it looks nice. It can look kind of like, a, you know, the Napa Valley with these curving lines of grapevines. Instead, it's just mulberry bushes. So it can look very, very aesthetically pleasing. Um, it's low to the ground. It's easy to reach. Um, one of the drawbacks, um, it's low to the ground. It's easy to reach. So predation is an issue. Deer, I, this is really tasty stuff. Deer, everything that eats leaves wants to eat this stuff. So you actually have to think about this and protect them. So let's think about what does it look like every year? That's normally one of the, the main questions. We're going to start with the winter reset. We're going to take everything back to ground zero. We're going to prune everything down to whatever that zero set point. If it's pollarding, we take it down to the tips of the leaders. 
or we take it down to the main trunk if we're pollarding. If we're coppicing, we're going to take it down to the stump. And that stump might be two to four inches off the ground. Um, I've seen high pollards where people are growing stuff for basket weaving and they've got mobility issues. And so they don't want to be bending over at all. So they will literally pollard it right at waist height so they can just do this and snip stuff right at waist height. So there's no bending over. I've seen people with, uh, with wheelchairs or those electric scooter things and they'll have them. It'll be a, a paved or paver sidewalk, a little electric scooter. And they're going out there and snipping stuff for basket weaving from a high pollard. And they set it to their little cart thing. Um, then we're going to process the material. If, uh, if this is in the garden. There's a lot of sugar and protein, a lot of nutrients in that. It's amazing. It breaks down really well into compost. It makes the most beautiful compost you've ever seen. So we can take that instantly, put it through a wood chipper. It's really soft at that point, goes through a wood chipper very quick and easy, and we can have awesome wood mulch. Or if you have a rocket stove, heat in your greenhouse or a rocket mass heater, something like that, this is perfect material to be using for something like this. They would actually coppice hazel and all kinds of trees, oak and ash, for the purpose of making fuel wood. I mean, we're in the first world. Most people here, I doubt there might be a couple people here who have put fire using old-fashioned methods. You use sticks like this big. You don't use big stuff. You don't go out and cut down a big tree and split it and put all that energy into it. Use little sticks because you can quickly get hot fire built up and then spread out the coals. You can regulate the heat. That's how you use fuel wood if you're cooking more primitively. And this, this is perfect for fuel wood. Or we can take that material and we can propagate it. So let's say we plant a little bit out. And you say, you know what? I want a thousand more of these. You take, you take everything that grew. All of that is first year growth. All of that is good to propagate. Um, then spring rolls around. It's management time. We need to fertilize. We need to water. And we need to mulch and protect these trees. If you do not fertilize and water and mulch your trees, they will not grow very well. If you want them to produce abundant material for you, you have to put energy and effort into them. You got to take care of them. Um, if you don't, you'll have just little twigs, little sticks. Okay, here, it's still a little twig. And then I'll ask, well, did you water it? Well, no. Did you, uh, did you mulch around it? No. Did you fertilize it? Well, there's lots of stuff in the birds and things. No. They didn't fertilize it. They didn't water it. They didn't mulch it. And then nothing grew. If you water it and fertilize it and mulch it, you'll get four. We've got pictures. What, uh, Karen is here somewhere. There you are. We've got hybrid mulberry that's this big around. That was this big around three months into the second year it was in the ground. So, and then we're looking at harvesting. So the first cut, you're going to let that grow up. Think of this like a lawn. If you're mowing your lawn, do you take it down to dirt? No, it'd kill it, right? So we want to let it grow up and then we take the top off of it. So we're going to cut it about 18 to 24 inches off the ground. We're going to take all that material that was on top. And we're going to process that. We're gonna either going to dry it or we're going to ferment it, shred it and ferment it. And then the second cut, we want to take it right above the first cut. Because right where we made that first cut, it's going to kind of heal over. And there's littler shoots. And that means we're going to get more and the stems will be smaller and thinner. That means we can shred even more of that material and turn it into food for our animals. And then progressively, 
we'll just keep taking cuts off of that. We always leave some growing below it, just like a lawn. We want a nice green stand of grass and we just top it and we keep topping it just like a lawn. And then at the end of the season, what do you do? You let it take all of that energy and put it back into the roots so it can grow big and strong the next year. Here's a picture of that probably about a three inch, three and a half inch diameter tree at the base. That is a uh, month two or three. Here's one that was cut in the winter of its first year. And as you can see, if you were to count, I counted and there's about 10 times as much growth in this one with all of these shoots right here, about 10 times as much growth as the first year growth. And I got it zoomed in. There's the first year growth. And the diameter on that is about equal to the diameter on most of these. All right. That is a massive increase in growth. So if you take care of them, they will produce abundantly. All right, here's that video, please. And in this case, it's flushing back up, pushing the hormone into the tips. To... Okay. A viewer left a comment about pollarding and whether you should pollard. The one the thing we didn't test. Yes, yeah, so I thought it'd be worth just having a quick discussion on yeah. the That's the one thing. Hi, folks. Welcome back. In this video, I'm going to be discussing the difference between pollarding and coppicing. So in my previous video on coppicing hazel, Correct. That's the winter today, reset. You reset you back to, to ground zero. And oh, the, the question was at the end of the season, yes, so I thought it'd be worth uh, do you cut it down to the stump? The yes, the end of the season is the winter reset. The so if you're coppicing, it goes down to a stump. Hi, folks. But if you're pollarding, you take this it back video, to that, that ground zero reset elevation. You don't want so to cut past that. Video on um, you want that, those, that, those ends, you know, like that big, tall stump that had all those ends. If you cut all you those ends the off and you reset yeah, so it to below that zero reset point, the differences you will and when you do one or the other. And that's what the topic of this video will be about. Don't have so all of those is very similar stem cells. To just it's the same idea. Taking up the and leaders, um, taking um, the we don't have to do this video, guys. We can just get from the stumps again. No big deal. The only difference with the pollarding. Hi folks, welcome back. In this video, I'm going to be discussing the difference between pollarding and coppicing. So in my previous video on coppicing hazel, which I did some, I did months, some ago, months ago, a viewer left a comment about pollarding and whether you should pollard or coppice. Anyway, so I thought it'd be worth just having a quick discussion on the differences and when you would do one or the other. And that's what the topic of this video will be about. So pollarding is very similar to coppicing, it's the same idea, you're taking out the leaders, um, taking off the terminal buds and you're encouraging flushing from the stumps again. The only difference with the pollarding is that it's actually taken out at a higher point than coppicing. So coppicing is traditionally really close to the ground and pollarding is at a certain height above the ground. So typically pollarding is around six foot um, above the ground and there's a couple of reasons. One of the main ones for a commercial scenario is for reducing grazing stress on the regrowth so in an area where you have potential for sheep or deer or rabbits to you know graze on the new fresh buds that's an ideal scenario to consider pollarding another area where you often see pollarding most commonly these days because uh, pollarding in a commercial sense is actually out of fashion it's, a, it's an old tradition although it is reviving but mostly you see it in town and amenity trees and you see it along sidewalks pavements they do a lot of pollarding of trees there and the main reason in that scenario is to keep it above head height for um, pedestrians and then they also keep it out of the reach of power lines etc so that's why you often see pollarded trees in town and that's the most common place you'd see it so in this example here it's a, it was a hazel that we coppiced and you can see there was quite a lot of vigorous growth came up from the stems now these were overstood hazel hadn't been coppiced for a long time but they still did flush back and you can see there's still some fresh buds coming ready for next year now the problem we had here this should have been sectioned off from sheep but sheep did manage to get in and if you take a close look at the leader of this stem you can see it was eaten off and pretty much every single one has been taken off so the terminal bud in every one of these shoots has been eaten so this would be a very good example of where pollarding would have been a, a 
consideration. Now, if we had known that sheep would have got in here, you know, then we would have needed to think about doing pollarding instead of the coppicing. But what might be a better solution in this scenario is actually we're on a bit of a track is to pollard above sheep height and then let this grow over the track and there would be a better solution here to be able to save these trees. So this is an, an older that we took this branch off a couple of years ago. In fact, it might have been a year ago. And the reason we took this down, it would actually higher up, it had snapped out. So it was over the track, which is why we removed this particular branch. And we reduced it down. You can see the epicormic growth that has sprung up from the cambium layer. And that's how coppicing and pollarding actually function. So we didn't actually do this either for coppicing or pollarding purposes, but it's the same mechanism at work. And in this case, it's flushing back up, pushing growth hormone into the tips to flush the shoots back out. These are pollarded trees in the, in the distance. So here we have a very good example of a pollarded willow. Now the landowner planted these willows about 20 years ago and then they pollarded it about two to three years ago, I think. But it's a very good example of how the tree will flush back and produce all these fairly evenly sized stems. So that's one of the main reasons that people would have traditionally done coppicing and pollarding was really to produce a product they could use, things like basket weaving or um, hurdle making, etc and it produces a fairly uniform product. So that's why they would have traditionally done it. So I think as I men mentioned previously, um, pollarding really is essentially the same process as coppicing. And the only real advantage is to get it above the height of grazing animals. But there are some disadvantages too, because once it gets at a certain height, working on <laughs> this particular tree with tools, you're working at a higher level, so certainly if you have something like chainsaws or whatever tool you're using, you're working above shoulder height, which is never a great idea. So it does make management a little bit harder. But certainly in terms of the risk from grazing animals, it's often a good choice to do. Interestingly, in this section, from what I've been told, traditionally maybe 100 years ago when all the coppicing crafts were flourishing, they actually used to come, um, the artisans used to come on a season. All right. Let's cut that a little bit short. Um, a little bit short um, and jump into some of the main questions people are going to be asking. How many trees do I need to plant, Nick? I've got two goats. How many trees? I can't answer that. Um, the trees are a dynamic system in and of themselves. The goats are a dynamic system in and of themselves. If your herd is growing, the number of trees is going to change literally month to month because the little animals get bigger, okay? So I say, yes. How many trees? Yes. Um, that many. However many you can put. Uh, start small. Uh, you can always use what you have. Nicole has box elder. So rather than cutting down all the box elder and... And, and put new trees in and wait a couple of years for those to get big enough to start harvesting, she just pollarded the box elder because it's a great fodder tree. So use what you have. Um, if you're going more production focused, we could go eight foot row spacing. So the rows are eight foot apart. We got trees planted every two feet in every single row. Everyone understand that? Eight foot apart rows, spacing, two foot, per acre. 12 foot rows further apart so we have more laneway access. We're looking at four foot spacing. We're going to space them apart even more. That's 900 per acre. Just to give you some numbers, some, some idea of how many trees we're talking about. It's not like 12 trees. We're talking about 900 an acre at pretty generous spacings. Um, it's situationally dependent. We planted 800 fodder trees in less than an eighth of an acre. We planted them six inches apart just because the numbers worked at those spacings. It was just arbitrary choice because the numbers worked. I did not plant them like that to get lots of production. I planted them like that 
because the cost of one of those trees or two or three of those trees that were eventually going to go was less than the money I'd get out of it selling cuttings. So I planted extra trees so I could get extra cuttings. And then eventually a whole bunch of those trees are going to be taken out of that system so that I have them spaced out a little bit further. So if you're doing things for propagation, plant them tighter. If you're planning it for a forest, that's kind of the loosest spacing. So when you plant them, um, you'll hear lots of different opinions on when you should plant things, summer, in the fall, in the winter. If you're planting bare root, um, you know, people ask, well, isn't it best to plant bare root trees in the fall? Well, I'd like to know where you're getting bare root trees in the fall. Because they dig them in the winter when they're dormant because it's less stress on the tree. So you're getting bare root trees late winter, early spring. So that's when you plant bare root trees. Um, if you're planting seed, frost, because what's going to happen? It's going to get hit by a frost, and it's going to kill them. They're not going to be ready for it. So seed needs to be planted in the spring after all danger of frost is passed. If you're planting potted plants, you can plant them in the fall. That's fine. Or those other times. Planting potted trees, Nicole and anyone that was at Nicole's workshop can attest to the pain of having to rip all of the soil off of those and prune the roots to make sure that we don't have circling and girdling roots. Harvest and preservation. Um, <clears throat> we are gonna stuff to animals oftentimes. Um, you can feed feeder pigs at about a 90, it's either a 92 or 98, I can't ever remember the number, 92 or 98, we'll just go 92% replacement ration without a reduction in growth and, and production. That's amazing. Um, so we can cut and carry fresh stuff every day for our animals, or we can dry it as tree hay. Used to be they would harvest these branches and dry it just like hay, except they'd bind it together in sheaves and they would stack it and make uh, big hay piles. Or we can ferment it as silage. That's simply the same process as corn silage. You take the leaves and the tender shoots and stems, shred them, compact them, and you ferment them anaerobically. Yep. Or we can pelletize. We can put them through a hammer mill and grind them up, and then we can put them through a pelletizer. Cut and carry fresh. Pigs love fresh mulberry leaves. We got our tree hay. That's what that looks like. We've got those sheaves made, and they're just hung up in a barn. The animals go nuts over them. We fermented as silage. It just looks like shredded up. It can be in buckets. It can be in barrels. It can be in pits. Whatever you can do to get an anaerobic situation. We can pelletize. You see, we have plant matter and a little bit of grain in here. And... It's really dark, but those are pellets. Um, so final thoughts. Um, man, if, if we include fodder trees in our systems, we're going to be able to grow feed for just about free. Yes, you have labor and time involved in it, but it's almost free. Um, we get to... I think that's really important. It gives us a lot of resiliency and a lot of options in the future. And it lets us snowball wealth. And if you want to buy fodder trees from me, you can do that every winter. I take reservations starting January 1st, every year, same time, at rareplantstore.com. All right, we're gonna line up here as long as that speaker lets me do it. The first question comes from online. And the question is, does my, it's a specific variety of mulberry, work the same as your your white mulberry. white mulberry. Okay, so red mulberry is low. It will work just fine. The reason why I like the white mulberry is it's been used for hundreds, if not thousands of years. I can't remember the history on it. Um, in Asia, grown for silkworm production. And whether they understood what they were doing or not, the result has been Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years of selection towards 
higher digestibility and higher protein. They just work better as feedstock for insects and animals. So that's why I like the white mulberry because it just makes better protein. But if you have red mulberry, don't by all means out. use it. If if I have a group of area that I'm using for coppicing pollarding, <clears throat> is there any benefit of having another area that's just nice looking that I had that I don't have that I'm not coppicing or pollarding on? Is there any like benefits to uh, wild animals that, that might come through or just by planting, just by having those trees there? Sure. Yeah. Um, so the willow is, is great as a windbreak. Um, you can use it as a privacy screen. Um, you know, if, if you get into looking at um, planting out a whole bunch of trees, um, man, it simply as we did today, it's simple as taking a cutting and jabbing it in the ground and you've got another tree. That is a game. Uh, windbreak, uh, the mulberries do produce berries. They're very bland and insipid. They don't taste good. They have a low acidity, but birds love them. Uh, word of caution. Do not plant a whole bunch of mulberries near where you park your car <laughs> and let those mulberries grow up into great big giant trees because they will get loaded down with fruit and you will have a purple vehicle. And I tell you what, they will stick in the treads of your shoes and they're just like manure. They will leave purple marks all over if you have carpet. It's, it's awful. It's hard to get off of your shoes. So be careful about that stuff. If you're coppicing, they should not be producing fruit. And actually, I, in, in coming years, I will be the only place I know of where you can actually buy male mulberry. Okay, so this one comes from online. Jed, what does pollarding prevent over coppicing? The audio chopped it. Pollard prevent. I don't know if it uh, prevents. Oh, it, it prevents uh, um, predation issues. Um, so if those branches are above the browse height, then they're not going to get nipped off. Um, as we saw in that little video, some sheep got in there and they nipped off all the terminal buds. So that's the very tip of the shoot. And they nipped that off before it could continue growing. And that's a problem. We don't want that happening. So if you need to pr protect your trees from predation by other herbivores, by deer, by goats, by sheep, whatever. Um, pollarding protects them from those animals. Okay. okay. Uh, Nick, uh, two, two questions related. Fertilizer for trees. What do, you, what do you recommend? How much? When? And in the event that you can't go buy whatever the product is at the store, what do you recommend? Um, anything that has nitrogen, phosphorus, uh, manure, fine. cow manure, any, any kind of animal manure is just fine. Um, you can use any of the, the commercial synthetic stuff. Um, I, I treat them just like other trees and shrubs. Um, just don't put too much or else you have a, a, a risk of, of burning the roots. But any... Any any fertilizer mix will do just fine. Okay, Josh from online says, what's your suggestion on the wood chipper, rent or buy? If you're using one all the time for for your uh, for your fruit tree, your fodder trees, um, if this is like a, a week to ferment, then I would buy one because you're going to use it weekly or at least monthly. If this is a once a year kind of thing, where you're just going to be stripping leaves off manually and you're not going to be shredding anything and you're just going to be cut and carry um, and you're going to be running everything else through the um, uh, rocket stove to heat your greenhouse or whatever and you're not chipping anything or you're just going to chip like once a year to get the big stuff uh, turned into mulch, then I'd rent one probably once a year. So Dr. Barry runs sheep and he accidentally rotationally grazed and coppice trees. He was cutting the trees down to get rid of the tree. But mm -hmm. then he would run them back through. Can you do anything like that with ducks? Anything that you can compass that you could you know, rotate ducks through and, and give them something to eat and then come back later and feed again? 
Well, problem is ducks aren't really herbivores. Um, yeah, you could you could do something like like duckweed or azola, um, and uh, and I've done that before where I've just protected them. But uh, yeah, mostly with these fodder trees, no. Um, it's mostly going to be something if you're feeding ducks or or poultry, you're either going to be pelletizing it with another source of feed. And we'll talk about that later. This going to be fermenting it. Hey, Roy, I'm going to take your question because Josh just asked one from online, but I'll ask okay. Josh it's afterwards. Okay. And use as a fodder because it's got a lot of leaf matter on it, but you didn't cover that. Um, I, I don't really like bamboo very much for that um, because not a whole lot of stuff likes to eat it. It's not very high protein generally. Um, the shoots are easy to digest. But the rest of it, it's just so hard, and it's so hard to process. Um, I, I just as soon leave it alone okay. and, and use it for building materials. And then, and then one more. Uh, you said a lot of this wasn't good for chickens. Mm -hmm. What would you recommend for chickens to get away from the feed store? That's what the next presentation is about. Okay, got it. Thank you. All right. This next one comes from Josh online. How do you get rid of things that were coppiced, and now you don't want them there anymore? Mm -hmm. ah! Okay, so uh, there is the, the eco-friendly version where you, you torch the stump and, and you would protect your other stumps from overheating. If you torch that stump and, and the, um, the crown, the root crown, you will kill the tree. So you can leave no residue and just heat it up. Um, if you're comfortable using herbicides, then you can always paint the stump with an herbicide. Um, you could always paint the stump with something flammable and set it on fire, but generally heat and uh, herbicides are the only two ways. Or you could go with grinding it out, using an auger to grind it out. Um, or what you can do is you coppice it and then you keep repeatedly cutting it. You let it get up about a foot tall and you cut it again. Let it get up a foot tall and you cut it again. What you're doing is you're depleting the stores of sugars in the root zone underground you're just harvesting everything it's got and eventually it'll die and then you'll just ha have a dead stump right there also pigs yeah mm -hmm. okay <clears throat> i have a couple of full-grown mulberry trees i'm not sure of the variety and when i cut take cuttings and give them to my rabbits they don't seem that interested will coppicing or pollarding them back maybe increase uh, palatability for them or should i get new trees should i plant white mulberry like i said i'm not sure of the variety of the mulberry it doesn't fruit it's 45 50 foot trees we'll cut it goes back increase the sugars um it it will uh, all of that that tender regrowth is going to be more palatable um you might have paper mulberry which is not nearly as palatable as the red mulberry or the white mulberry the white mulberry I, i've never seen an animal that that eats leaf matter turn it down it is, it's like candy. They love it. Um, if it's paper mulberry, I've seen lots of stuff turn their nose up at that. So, yeah, if it's paper mulberry. Ah, that's Brycinetia papifera. And I'm talking about Morris alba. It's even a different genus. Okay, when making silage, is, is there anything you need to know? to do that right so you don't accidentally poison your animals. Yes, so what you're gonna wanna do if you're making silage is you're going to shred it, you're going to compact it, uh, you can add some diluted molasses, sugar water, anything to feed the lactobacillus. You can actually even put a little bit of uh, lab culture in there, lactobacillus uh, bacterial culture in with it. If you wanna be really super um, you know, particular about it, but the main thing is you compact it, you get as much air out of it as possible, and then you keep it restricted on air. You want to close it up with, with plastic or put a lid on it that is pretty airtight, put a date on it so that you know when it went in there and give it two, three, four months to ferment before you start pulling out of it. And then keep it air restricted um, don't make a big old batch and then just take a little tiny handful out because it will start going bad. So it's better to have multiple little ones. Correct. Okay. If you're using small amount, make small batches. Okay. Eco Mouse, your question is probably more suited to the next session, which is more oriented towards uh, 
poultry. Uh, David wants to know what time of year do you take cuttings to transplant and when do you plant them? Um, <clears throat> so it depends on, on the tree. So if we're talking about the hybrid willow and the hybrid poplar, then you want to take those, really those you can take just about any part of the, any time of the year. Um, the hotter and drier it is, the more you're going to have to baby them. If you want to dead simple, I don't have to think about this. It's just going to work. Then you take them in the winter and you stick them in the ground in the winter. You want about a eight to 12 inch stick and you want to bury that about three quarters of the way and leave two or three buds sticking out. And then that should, you just plant it right where it needs to go or you can pot it and, um, and that should grow just fine for you. So cut it in the winter, stick it in the ground immediately. You don't have to use any rooting hormone. So those two work perfect for that. The white mulberry, you need to, it's a lot more involved, a lot more complex. Uh, you need to learn how to propagate with uh, softwood cuttings, and you're going to need to use an intermittent mist system and some hormone treatment. But that is a late spring, early summer thing. And you take those cuttings and stick them in uh, some rooting medium. All right, let's jazz hand Nick for his first session. Thank you so much. So you, tell us what your next session is going to be. So my next session is going to be expanding out on this, and we're going to be looking at how to feed our birds more profitably. And we're going to be talking about some insects and a little bit more about the pelletizing, and just give you an idea of what, uh, what those units kind of cost. Great. Well, thank you so much. We are going to come back at quarter after four because it's quarter to four right now, according to my watch. So tell me if I'm wrong. And in the interim, remember, you can set up a work in session up there on the dry erase board. If you haven't asked me how I know, put that there, guys. We'll see you in about half an hour.